Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here um, this morning. It's incredible to be in Europe during the World Cup, coming from a place where our football is played with a very funny shaped ball, unlike what we're doing here in Europe. So I like the, uh, the opportunity to be here. It's very exciting. ICT has been talking about technology. We've been talking about the advances. We've been talking about the new strategies and the deployment of these incredible capabilities. And I've just started to hear talk about security. When we talk about the identities, folks are talking about um, all of the data that's being collected. Everything that your companies do every single day, the very DNA of your organizations are maintained stored electronically. They're transmitted electronically, they're created electronically, they're stored electronically. And there are, are trillions of euros in value uh, stored electronically. The adversaries know that the incredible value that resides in that data. And there are organizations I'm gonna talk about in some detail that are targeting that intelligence, that information, every single day. So I spent 24 years in the FBI, the last seven or eight focused primarily on cyber issues. I ran all the cyber investigations worldwide for the FBI, and I was involved very heavily in the US government strategy to protect data, and I've worked quite a bit in Europe um, um, on these issues with various countries and representatives uh, on these issues. Um, I can tell you that in my experience within the FBI, every large corporation that I've been involved in has suffered a breach. And there are two types of companies, those that have been breached and those that don't yet know that they've been breached. Okay, and I firmly believe that. I'm currently, for the last two and a half years since I left the, retired from the FBI, working for a company called CrowdStrike, which does computer network security for major organizations. And it's my belief that what we're seeing is only on the uptake. And when we talk about these evolving technologies and virtual currencies and the movement to mobile devices and the cloud, the networks are expanding and they're becoming more vulnerable, not less vulnerable. And they're carrying much more information, which makes them much more attractive to our adversaries. Most people, um, know, I hope, that this is a worldwide, a global problem. It cuts across every single industry. Many people believe this is the, related to the financial services sector and personally identifiable information, but that's not accurate. This cuts across every single sector. Transportation, communications, technology, energy, healthcare, in addition to financial services. It's not just about stealing data that people can commoditize and turn in to cash, but it goes much beyond that. It's about the theft of corporate strategies, the theft of technology, intellectual property and research, theft of communications, a cut, cut, a cutting across all organizations. So who are the attackers? I think it's really important to understand when we're talking about what the risks are to companies who the attackers are. And this is a very important philosophy uh, for me about understanding who the attackers are. Because there are not computers that are stealing from computers. There are human beings that are using the networks as a tool or a weapon to get to the data. At the end of the day, if we're talking about securing, securing data, we must remember that there are human beings that are doing this. So for us, for those of, of whom want to protect data, you've got to understand who the adversary is. First of all, there are absolutely terrorist groups that are targeting critical infrastructure today. And I can tell you when my time in the FBI, there were groups that are sympathetic to the jihadi cause who've targeted the West for many years. They've targeted throughout Europe for many years. And they are moving from kinetic attacks to electronic attacks. And they've actually called for electronic jihad, understanding that all the critical infrastructure 
that our nations reside on and depend upon are based on electronic transactions. There are computers that run electric and power and water and sewer and transportation and communications. And they're looking to target that to have that same type of an impact. It's important to understand because a devastating attack against infrastructure will have cascading, a cascading impact across all of society. Ima imagine in a particular city if electricity is out for a week or two weeks or two months, what that impact would be. The adversaries know that, and again, they're using it as a weapon or as a, as a potential target that they can impact society. Hacktivists and vigilante groups. Um, in your corporation, in your organization, it's really important to understand these are groups that have a political or social agenda, and they're using the networks as a weapon to target your organizations. Whether you, they don't like the way you manufacture, they don't like the way you handle um, the ecology, they don't like the way you deal with other countries, and they target your networks to have an impact on your organization. Um, so groups like Anonymous, the Syrian Electronic Army, um, LulzSec, these types of groups you may have heard about in the, in the media. As, an, as a, a, a corporate executive, an owner of data, you've got to be aware of, of the actors. I'm going to skip past that one. Cyber criminals are ones that we hear most often about. Organized crime groups that are collaborating together, they're meeting online virtually. In many of these cases, these individuals have never met in the physical world, yet they gather in the virtual world to meet and collaborate. And each of the members of the group has a very specific um, capability. One that does reconnaissance, somebody who prepares malicious software to deploy on the network, somebody who goes onto the network and does reconnaissance internally on the network, somebody who exfiltrates all the data and then takes it and turns it into, into cash, into money that they can disperse among the rest of the group. These organized crime groups are primarily targeting the financial services sector, but that's not all they're doing. They're involved now in extortion, where they're going in and encrypting data and extorting companies to decrypt it only for 150,000 euros, 75,000 US dollars. So these criminal, cyber criminal groups are having a large impact, but they're not focused solely on financial services. Oftentimes, people believe that that's the case. The final one here are nation states. So various countries that are stealing data specifically to enhance their commercial enterprise, to allow them to become much more competitive on the global market. They're targeting intellectual property and research and development. They're targeting those corporate strategies that provide their home industries with a leg up. I can tell you in my time in the FBI, working collaboratively with partners around the world, in Europe and elsewhere, um, we have seen these nation states um, shut companies down because of the value of the property they were able to steal. So on Friday, they were in business, suffered some loss over the course of, of a couple of weeks, and then out of business after, after a month or so. Again, across every single infrastructure, to the tune of billions and billions of euros. Um, most of the organizations that I've seen targeted in the United States, they're global companies. So an attack against a company that's in the US has an impact worldwide in terms of productivity and economic impact, et cetera. I had a particular organization that I worked with in the healthcare industry. They were manufacturing biomedical devices. And in this particular company, they said that their life cycle was five years from concept through the manufacturing and the testing and the sales, five years. And that their competitors in China, same types of products, same, same field, 18 months, their life cycle. Because they didn't have to go through the concept and the manufacturing or the, the, uh, the developing the manufacturing processes, they just went to manufacturing and sales. So they cut three and a half years off of the life cycle, which gave them a significant advantage and cost them 
hundreds of millions of US dollars. So the threat is real, it's significant. I'm talking primarily here about the theft of data, but there are two other things that we have to be aware of that the adversaries have the capability to perform. First, they have the ability to destroy data completely, and we've seen this happen around the world in multiple locations. The one that, is, that has come out most publicly uh, that, that you've likely heard about is Saudi Aramco. According to the media reports, more than 30,000 computers on their corporate network were completely destroyed, shut down, unable to be uh, booted up, unable to retrieve data. So imagine if an entire subnet in your organization was destroyed. You couldn't do payroll, you couldn't do online sales, uh, you couldn't communicate with, with your employees around, around the, the country or around the globe. So a significant impact. That's happened also in South Korea. It's happened in the U.S., where whole segments of a network have been completely destroyed. The other third piece, theft of data, destruction of data, the third one that people don't often think about is the integrity of the data. So with the depth and breadth of access that we see adversaries have today, they have the ability to go in and change data. And if the data that you rely on every single day to do whatever it is you do is changed, it's manipulated, and you don't know that it's been changed, bad things are going to happen. So the risk is high to organizations. I've been talking extensively throughout the U.S. to, um, to directors, on boards of directors for major companies, and just to really to get them to understand and kind of own, own the risk. We've talked for years, two decades actually, about defense in depth and how do we layer our defenses to protect, much like we do in the physical world where we have layers of defense. You have a fence around the building, you have uh, an alarm, you've got a, a guard, multiple layers of defense. Except in this day and age, today, with the sophisticated adversaries that we're seeing, Defense in depth isn't working. And I say it's silently failing because defense in depth will stop many low level attackers and many commodity type attacks. But the most sophisticated adversaries will work for weeks or months or years to get to the network that they want to get to because of the value of the intelligence that's there. And we're not able to, to stop them completely. The networks are too large. I've dealt with organizations that have 100,000 endpoints on their network. Imagine trying to protect in the physical world a building with 100,000 doors. It's just, it's not sustainable and it's not able to be addressed in the long term. So while we might be able to stop the opportunistic attacks, the sophisticated adversaries are getting around the networks. You build a 10 meter wall, they bring a 12 meter ladder and they're into the network. My time in the FBI, agents uh, went out dozens of times per week and knocked on the doors of major companies dozens of times a week, some of the biggest companies in the world, and told them that they'd been breached. Because in the course of an unrelated investigation, they found their data being shipped out of the country. And in many of those cases, the owners of the network said, we've not been breached, we've checked, we've looked at our firewall logs, we bring in our information security officer, we've not been breached. And after we show them their data, they recognize clearly that the data came off of their network. They would go back and check and find out that their network had been breached four months earlier, eight months earlier, two years earlier, which means that the adversary had unfettered access onto that network for four months, eight months, two years. Unfettered access completely. So what do we do? How do we address this? There needs to be a paradigm shift in the way we do this. Because the old model merely of prevention is not going to work. That's not sustainable. If your bonus, if you're the, the chief information security officer and your bonus is based on your ability to prevent all attacks, it's gonna be a very lean holiday season, okay? Because you can't prevent all of the attacks. You want to, and that is an objective. You must practice defense in depth.
but it, in and of itself is not sustainable. The measure needs to be not can we prevent, but how soon after the adversary makes uh, uh, is successful in an attack until we're able to detect it. And how do we narrow that gap? Because it can't be four months or eight months or two years on the network undetected. That's not sustainable. That's not acceptable. You are going to suffer significantly, as are your investors, your shareholders, your customers, your employees. They are going to suffer if that's the, if that's the gap. I believe that intelligence is the key in, in, in this area. And when I talk about intelligence, it's about understanding who your adversary is. It's about being much more aware. In this space, technology is not the answer to this. Technology is a piece of the solution, but it is not the sole solution. Because it is more, when we're talking about this type of security, it's more about strategy and policy and process. And technology helps and it allows, you to, allows us to scale. And technology is an important piece, but it is not the only piece. Organizations that have these intelligence capabilities are the ones that are going to be most successful in this space. So when I'm talking about intelligence, it's about understanding what's happening. Could you imagine... I work with companies now where there's been a, a security breach. And they say that this computer has been, has been breached. There's a virus on this computer and it's been breached. So we'll take this computer offline and we'll put a brand new clean computer onto the network and now we're okay. Okay? Could you imagine that tomorrow you drive home, you pull up to your house, and as you walk into your house, you realize that your front door has been kicked in. Somebody smashed in your front door. So is there a person in this room that would pull out their telephone and call the locksmith to come repair your door and say, my door is broken, can you come fix the lock and then go to bed? Is there a person that would do that? Of course not. You would ask, who was in my house? What did they take? What did they leave behind? Why were they here? Are they still here? Are they still here? Of course you would ask that. Yet, in computer security, people just want to fix the hardware and then move along. Wrong strategy. Who is targeting my company? Why would they want to target my company? What is the type of information they're looking for? What are the tactics that they use? What tools? What techniques do they use? What procedures do they use? Because if I understand all of that, if I know why they're there, I can be much more robust and resilient in the development of my network, and more importantly, I can actually look for them on my network to detect them if I know who they are and what their capabilities are. It's really an important concept, I think. Again, this is human beings. How do we track human beings within the network? So here's where the technology does help. The ability to provide you granular level visibility into what's happening on the network, using the right technology in your environment to collect data to help you find who's within the network. And when I say collect data, I'm not talking about content. I'm not talking about reading your emails. I'm not talking about looking at your documents. I'm talking about watching the processes that are occurring on the network. Because for an adversary to get onto your network and to do damage, they've got to make access, they've got to make changes to the environment, they've got to establish communications off of your network to, to pull data out or to read data that's on your network. There are a number of things that they've got to do to be successful. And if you know who they are, why they're there, the tools that they're using, you can look within your environment to detect it. Too many people are watching the perimeter only, and they're not watching within the environment. So if we look aggregately at big data, large swaths of data, we're going to be in a much stronger position to detect the anomalous activity, the unusual activity that indicates that an adversary is within that environment. Oftentimes, people are reactive. They're reacting to the fact that they've seen data leave 
and they're looking for, for indicators that their network has been compromised, that there's malware on their network, or that there are particular exploits within their environment. But if you actually are proactive and are hunting on the network looking for some of these indicators that there is an attack ongoing, you can mitigate the, the impact of the attack. They can't be on the network for four months or eight months or two years. You've got to narrow it down to minutes or hours. And if you do that, you have the ability to mitigate the consequences of the attack. This is key. The organization's ability to detect and respond and mitigate. And those that do it now, those that are thinking of security now, are the organizations that are going to have the most success. Because it's not just the loss of financial information. It is the risk to the reputation that your organization has developed over many years or decades. And it can be lost in an hour. I can tell you organizations in the U.S. that have lost billions of dollars in value because of the impact on their reputation because they failed to secure data. So for you all as leaders in your organization, I think that first of all, we have to accept this as a risk. It is a business risk like every other risk. We, we can't look at this differently. It's the same risk as you're building a manufacturing plant in a new country or you're worried about valuation of currency. Whatever business risks, risks you currently are addressing, this is another business risk. Don't look at this as a completely separate risk. It is another business risk. Accept it as a significant risk. You are leaders in your organizations, and the leader sets the pace for the rest of the pack. If you, as a leader in your organization, are not accepting this and treating this seriously, others are not. Others are not. This is a whole of company issue. It is not just the chief technology officer's issue or the chief information officer's issue. This is everybody's issue, in the C-suite especially, starting with the CEO and the board of directors, including the CFO and the general counsel and the COO and the head of sales. They all own the data. They all are responsible. They all have an obligation to protect it and to work in a collaborative way. I just said that. You've got to have a plan within your organization. Again, it's, it's not if, but when it will happen. Organizations need to be planning today for this to be preventive, to be proactive, to be able to mitigate the consequences. But if that all fails, you need that response plan in place. You're going to have to respond. How do you deal with the media? How do you deal with regulators? How do you deal with your shareholders? How do you deal with your clients, your customers? These are critical issues that have to be addressed. The last piece is um, there's got to be compliance and accountability. This is not something you do once on an annual basis like going to your doctor for a checkup. This is something that has to be done 365 days a year, 24 by 7. It is a constant evaluation of the environment that you're operating in. So this is kind of high level. Um, I could go into great detail into all of these areas, but I wanted to provide some concepts here uh, that, that I think are really, really critical for people to think about when you walk away from here. It's not just about a piece of malware on the network. It's that there are people somewhere that are coming at your data that are coming into your organization, and what are you going to do to protect yourselves? So uh, what I would ask is that as you go back to your organizations, internally, to have the courage to challenge people on this issue, to have the strength, because there are people who aren't so interested in security because it impacts the effectiveness, they believe, of the organization. I would argue that the organization is going to be a lot less effective if it suffers a significant breach. So I challenge you all to go back to your organizations, to take this seriously, to ask people hard questions and to lead the way because our failure to do so, our failure to act in this area is going to have a tremendous impact on your organizations and I believe on our society. So thank you very much.